I think that's important to really realize that we have the inner workings, the mechanisms to do this. You know, I'm just trying to remember where I read this, but it was very interesting theory how language affects DNA. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Where where did I read this? And, yeah. and so that when you articulate an idea, and particularly if you put some spiritual force into whatever you're saying is, that this is one of the epigenetic. I, I think it could have been Bruce Lipton in the active, Biology of Belief. It, perhaps it it was that, but this this was some research. Now, I, I didn't read this from Bruce. I don't know that he said this, but it it was. I have to really look this up. Russian Russian scientists. Um, and I taught it in my class a few years ago, and I haven't re-accessed it. But I think that the words and, and thoughts and articulation in language are part of that effect on the DNA and the junk DNA, according to this theory. Now what? It's our activating intelligence. And imagine what it might be that we can't even figure right now, but what it might be by putting uh, interviews like this up on the Internet where this information is saturating through the Internet. We're, we're putting so much really good information right now into this matrix of consciousness that we're still catching up to what that might be about. Well, that's exactly right. The noosphere, the thinking layer of Earth is being infused with this conversation times hundreds of thousands of people who are at their own emerging edge of consciousness. So we're not talking about just everybody, but the people where there is something of a higher consciousness, greater complexity, greater creativity being expressed, wherever that is, particularly right. when it connects with two or more. Just like you and I, it, 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 because the resonance amplifies the signal. Right, exactly. So, I, I, you know, when I teach my class, Agents of Conscious Evolution, which is available now on the Shift Network, I will be saying hello into an empty camera Right. every Tuesday night from 5 to 7 Pacific. And there are people from maybe 100 different countries on the call. And I've coined a new word for it, is that we are every here. Every here. Because everybody is here. They'll yeah. say, I'm here in Australia. I'm here in California. I'm here, you know, in Great Britain. And I thought, now this is really non-local. Because although our physical bodies are in these different places, when we are in this shared space of consciousness, we're here, like just you and I right now. I have no idea where you are physically. Chico. Where are you? I'm in Chico, California. <laughs> and I'm in Santa Barbara, California. But you, you could be in New Zealand. Right. And it, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference in this, you know, the way this conversation feels. You know, and it is important to come up with new linguistic terms to define this. Because there, there's so much that you and I might be able to talk about, and, and we sort of know what we're talking about without the words. But little by little, we're developing language uh, every, every here, you know? Every here, yeah. And there's, there's, you know, along these lines, uh, along the lines of technology and um, innovation, there's a wonderful new book by Peter Diamandis called Abundance. Hmm. The future is better than you think. I'll check it out. It's really worth it, particularly as we're talking about the transformational movement and the mainstream. Peter is, is a major innovator. He's a founder of the Singularity University with Ray Kurzweil, where uh, brilliant young uh, people who want to become social entrepreneurs using high technology yeah. For the social good. Yeah, Ray, Ray is pretty amazing. Well, the two of them together, 
Peter and Ray, I think like uh, we talk about new archetypes. Right. Well, I think those two men are archetypes of social, technological, entrepreneurial innovators that probably, in terms of the physical world, have the greatest impact on changing things right. than, than, than other aspects of our work. So you have the inner consciousness, but then you have the external capabilities. And Peter coins a, a, a phrase, I think it's from this, the um, uh, Santa Fe Institute, uh, phrases adjacent possibilities. So, for example, when a wheel was invented, it was a simple innovation. But the adjacent possibility of the wheel, right. the wheel barrel, and then the this, and then the car, and then the plane, and then the rocket, and then the moon, <laughs> adjacent possibilities. Right. So I have been considering the adjacent possibilities of the innovations in every sector of human endeavor. I see it as a wheel, like health, education, economics, science and technology. You put that together and you look at the adjacent possibilities of our collective innovative capabilities and you really see uh, restoring the earth, freeing the people, exploring the universe. Yep. You really see that quantum jump. Yeah, and, and I see things happening too. This for this year, for the first time in many, many years, there's more small farms than there are less small farms. And Italy is pretty much GMO free. And it what's allowing that is people aren't feeling so isolated because they're being able to connect and communicate and figure out what's going on. We're not so uh, isolated just with TV or a radio. We're actually starting to communicate on a global level and that's doing things and allowing things that before this time would have been impossible. That, that's, uh, that is very true. So true. Yeah. You know what I like about your message, Barbara? What? Is it, <laughs> is it underlies in a subtle form. I, I wrote a book on some of the dangers, the social and neurological dangers of rigid belief systems because mm -hmm. of our neurological cognitive process just filtering out everything that conflicted with previously held beliefs. But sometimes a message like yours, it's, it's subtle in a way, but it has power in a feminine way. It, it doesn't have that bang, but it has that, that subtle feminine push and it allows people to let that in past their filters Sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I compare my perspective got started when, when I saw the astronauts take pictures of Earth from space. See, that overview perspective was able to completely awaken us. We, when you walk around on this planet, you don't really see it's a round, beautiful right. blue planet circling the sun. I mean, our nervous system doesn't pick that up. But... We've been told we're one planet, but when you saw it like that, it changed everything. I would say I had a fundamental experience of being in that astronaut perspective, but seeing Earth as a living system with the noosphere, the communication systems, the technological systems, the innovations, being part of one planetary system being born. Right. And... That is actually logically true. Yeah. But it's invisible. Yeah, the, ol the only way that that couldn't be true is if, for some reason, conscious evolution stopped. Right. Because if and you look at history, that's what it's been doing the whole time, is building and building upon more and more higher platforms of conscious perception. You're so right. And the that when you, you mentioned earlier that... Evolution has been going on for billions of years, but the species involved in it were not conscious of evolution, certainly not a conscious when they think were going to cause their own extinction. Right. <laughs> but most species that ever existed were extinct before we got here. So right. nature is always selecting and perfecting. 
testing for what it is that works better. So when you see our situation and you realize that now we're the species is being selected. <laughs> well, let's, let's hope we live up to it. <laughs> well, what conscious evolution means is become conscious that we are affecting everything. Then we have to become conscious of what vision we choose. Yeah. You see, that's why the idea of emerging what's visionary is no longer just a nice idealistic thing. Because as we envision it, so we create it. Yeah, you know, when just before this interview, I felt myself a little bit nervous, and I'm usually not too nervous when I do an interview, but I realized that it wasn't just you, but it's, it's the message. Because I think if we don't do this as a human species, what you're talking about, we're not going to be able to continue to live on the planet. Because the, it, it's like changing your mind about being pregnant. It's not going to happen. You're not going to go back to the old right. system. Even though they have the military, the media, they're taking control. They're trying desperately to, like in the chaos theory, where you have these two systems, we're in the chaos, and they're trying to pull us back and restabilize the old, but we can't. We're either going to break down or break through. Exactly. That's, that's exactly right. And um, I feel that the what one of the things that I'm working on with the Shift Network is what we're calling Birth 2012. Right. And this is day on December 22nd, 2012. It has been selected as the day to celebrate what's emerging, what's being born, what's innovative, creative, and working. So let's say December 22nd, 21st, in the Mayan prophecies is like the ending of a phase. Many people see it as the end, as a doom. But right. what I really believe, like a birth, the time in the womb of self-consciousness and just in the womb of um, separated uh, competitive systems is coming to an end. And, but the phase of the creative, the synergistic, the connected parts of our species is growing rapidly. Well, you the, the sense of concern for each other is growing rapidly. So um, it's very important if we're insistent right out, you know, out of equilibrium, it's seeking a higher structure. And that's right. why we are so, all of us, right now. Yeah, and, and I think that the idea of equilibrium brings up a good point. Th this is why we are so polarized, because it, it's comfortable being a Republican or a Democrat, and that's it. But if you try to find the middle ground, which is where the truth almost ultimately lies, there's a, a feeling of being off balance, because all of a sudden you're noticing you have to keep your balance. You can't just lay on one side or lay on the other side. And I think part of the new consciousness, it's allowing us to feel this balance in a, in a higher kind of a way. And I remember when I was riding a bike, I, I tried so hard to ride this bike and my, my left brain was just going to the left, to the right, and I was falling. But something magical happened. There was a transition of consciousness to my right brain, left brain, coherence, body, mind, and all of a sudden, I wasn't trying not to fall. I was just riding, and it was like this amazing feeling of balance, and all of a sudden, I realized that what was very difficult to keep doing before had now almost become difficult to fall, and I was riding along, and I, I couldn't fall, and I thought that was so amazing. That is interesting, yes, yes.